respond in your prayers. Murr continued to keep Rusty Leap, Hank Picklesimer, Case Atkins, Sherry Ward, Amber Swindler, Larkin Hayes, Jim Wilgus, Carolyn Hall, and Jim Haney in your prayers uh, this week. That's all the announcements I have. Uh, Chris has been going over his psalms, so I'd like to read uh, Psalms 46, 1 through 3. God is our refuge and our strength. The very presence help us in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear through the earth gives way, through the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, through the waters roar and foam, through the mountains tremble as it is swelling. This reminds us that when trouble happens, God's always there. He's near us at all times. As Thomas, go to God in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful and blessed to be able to come here this morning to worship you, to sing praises to you, Lord. Be with Jeremy as he leads us in songs. Be with Chris as he gives us the lesson this morning. That if someone feels the need to come forward, that they will do so. And if they are lost and want to put you on baptism, Lord, that they will make that decision this morning, Lord. Lord, continue to be with their elders and our deacons and watch over them and the decisions they make for this congregation, Lord. Lord, we ask you to continue to let us be truthful and faithful to your word, Lord. Let us study it and be a shining light within our community, Lord. To let your love always show and shine. Lord, forgive us when we do fall short. It's in Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Would you stand, please? We'll sing three songs, and then Trevor will have her prayer.
thank you for the day. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to be in your house. Lord, we thank you for this weekend that we have to set aside and be thankful for the freedoms that we have in this country. Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to meet freely and to worship and sing praises to your name. Thank you, Lord, for those men and women who fought for our rights to do this. And pray, Lord, that you continue to be with uh, those serving now and with our government. Uh, pray, Lord, that you would guide and direct them and that they would look to you for direction. Lord, we thank you for Chris and his family and Dave and his family and all the work that they do here. Pray, Lord, that they would receive a blessing and uh, continue to look to you for, for the guidance. And Lord, we thank you for our leadership, the elders and the deacons and all the work that they've done, especially during this uh, difficult time of uh, the COVID. Lord, we just uh, thank you for their, their wisdom and their knowledge and we just pray that you continue to be with them. Lord, we pray for those who are on our prayer list. You know their needs and their situations. We just pray that your hand be with them. Lord, we pray that you be with Samantha and Ben in their upcoming wedding. Pray, Lord, that uh, you would bless them and that you would always remain the center of their relationship. And Lord, we just pray that you continue to be with this church here in the community and all the work that it does. Pray, Lord, that it would be pleasing in your sight and ultimately draw those closer to you. And Lord, we pray that if there be one here today that doesn't know you, we pray that today would be the day that they would come forward and accept you into their lives. Lord, be with us as we enter this time of our service. Be with Chris as he brings us the message. In Jesus' name, amen. There seems to be a lot of uncertainty in the country and we live in today due to the virus. Uh, change is not always comfortable or easy. I know a lot of people are saying that they just want the normal to be back. What is, con what is considered normal may vary from person to person. With all the struggles of everyday life, there is one constant, but it does require change. We as Christians need to remember that change is something that is needed in our life as we are not perfect. And we need to change the way that we live and try to be more like Jesus. We should always strive to be more like Jesus every day. He is constant, perfect, and is always the same. He loves you and he loves me. God sent his son Jesus from heaven to live a perfect life and to be a sacrifice for us. 
and we get to remember and give thanks for Jesus' sacrifice. Let us now concentrate on the sacrifice of Jesus as we take the emblems that represent his body and blood. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come to you this day thanking you so much for all the many blessings that you've given us, Father. Thanking you for the perfect example that Jesus is and still is and was, Father. As we partake this bread that represents his body, pray so that we do this in a pleasing manner. It's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we continue our prayer of thanks. We're thankful for the blood that was sacrificed on the cross, that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins, Father. As we think back at the cross, we pray that our minds are concentrated on Jesus. Thank you for all that you do for us. Through your son's name we pray. Amen. Another part of the commandment is the giving back. Um, back in the back of the room, there's two buckets where we can give our offering. Let's go to God in prayer at this time. Father, you, sir, you are so good to us. You give us so many things. So many things that we take for granted each and every day, Father. From our health to our homes to the jobs to our families and friends that we have. For our family here at Rome. We're thankful for each and everything that you have given us, Father. We're thankful for the means that we have to be able to support our families, to be able to give back to you. As we give back, Father, I pray that we do it in a pleasing manner and we do it happily and joyfully. Pray that you be with the ones that are unable to be with us, Father. The ones that are traveling, be with them as well. The ones that are sick, be with those. The ones in the hospital, take care of them as too. Thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for your son. It's through his name that we pray. Amen. For a lesson this morning, scene number 684. Would you stand, please? <clears throat> Would you stand, please?
The scripture Chris has chosen for this morning comes from Exodus chapter 12, verse 37 and 38. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. Good morning. It's good to see so many of you with us this morning. Um, this morning we'll be studying from the Psalm 117. This has the distinction of being the smallest psalm in the entire book of Psalms, and I think the shortest chapter in the entire Bible. Uh, so this psalm is tiny. It uh, comes in at an amazing two verses long, but it is power Hat. I think this psalm is going to challenge us this morning. It's going to speak to us in powerful ways, I think. Let's, let's dive into the text. Praise the Lord. Now, let's stop right there because when we talked about psalms in the beginning of this series, we noticed that many of the psalms are lament psalms. And then uh, the greatest majority behind lament psalms in the book of Psalms are praise psalms. And so when you see praise the Lord, this call to praise Him, it's not unusual, right? There are a great many psalms of praise in the book of Psalms. And so everything seems normal to this point, right? Like I said, this psalm is going to challenge us this morning. But here in the opening line, it seems fairly normal. Praise the Lord. Then he says this really odd statement, all nations. Praise the Lord, all nations. Now, this comes from the mouth of a Jew. This is incredibly interesting, right? Praise the Lord, all nations. The Jewish people weren't, didn't think God was an inclusive God. They thought he was exclusively their possession, just for the family of Abraham, right? He was theirs, and all nations would, would never really praise God. Uh, and the Jewish people didn't really want all nations to praise God. They certainly would have been comfortable attributing this praise to themselves. Jewish nation, Abraham's family, praise the Lord. But when you hear praise the Lord, all nations, it kind of makes you stop and think for a second, doesn't it? Remember... Psalms was never meant to be read very quickly. It was meant to be read contemplatively, very slowly, uh, very thoughtfully. And so if you read through this tiny psalm very quickly, you miss its power. And so this morning, we're going to break it down a little bit. And we're starting here with this term, all nations. Praise the Lord, all, all nations. The scripture reading may have seemed a little bit odd to you this morning. Why are you going back to Exodus to talk about the Psalms. Well, I think Exodus, the passage that Trevor read for us this morning, may be the first time you really see God's inclusivity, a time where He includes other people in His nation that's special to Him. So, a long time before the Exodus even, there's a man named Abraham. And God comes to this man and he says, your descendants, your children are going to be in a special type of relationship with me. A relationship that is unlike any other relationship he's ever had with a family before. And that small family will grow into an enormous nation. And God's going to be in a special type of relationship with that family. But it wasn't just with that one family, was it? If you still got your Bibles open... To Exodus 12, you saw that a great mixed multitude came with the children of Israel out of Egypt. And so there are some Egyptians that come out of exile, that come out of Egypt with the Israelite people. They wander through the wilderness and eventually make their way to Mount Sinai. And some of those Gentile folks that came out of Egyptian slavery with Israel are at the base of Mount Sinai when God gives them the law. They have entered into this special relationship with God just like Israel has. They're His special people too. So 
you don't have to go very far in Scripture to find God including people. It seems to be one of the things that He likes to do. He's a very inclusive God. Jonah, for example, is told to go preach to a Gentile nation to tell them to change their lives or God's going to condemn them. He's going to punish them if they don't change their lives. Jonah was a normal Jewish guy, right? He reacted as most Jews would have given this instruction. And so he says, go to a Gentile nation. No. And he goes out of his way uh, to, to disobey the command of God, to get away from teaching this Gentile nation to come back to God. God cared about them. He cared about their souls. He cared about including them in His kingdom. And so the Gentile or the Jewish nation was always designed not to be God's sole people. He made a covenant, He made an agreement with whoever was at the base of Mount Sinai. Most of them were Jewish people, most of them were Abraham's family, right? But in the mix of those people were Egyptians, maybe some Syrians, maybe some Canaanite peoples who had come out of slavery with the Israelites. And so you find him including people from the very beginning of his agreement with, his covenant with, if we can use the biblical word, with Israel. And so this phrase, praise the Lord, all nations, our knee-jerk reaction to it is, whoa, wait, praise the Lord, all nations? That doesn't, that's, that's not what a Jewish person, person would say. This is outside of maybe their, 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 their comfort zone for sure, out of their repertoire, <laughs> maybe. This is not the way they would think. But here by inspiration, we find a Jewish writer saying, praise the Lord, all nations. And so our knee-jerk reaction is, whoa, but then you start thinking about it, and you, you see, oh, well, yeah, there's, there's inclu he's included people in Mount Sinai. The, Gent uh, the Jews were supposed to be a light to the nations. He even sent one of his own prophets to a Gentile nation to beg with them to repent so God didn't have to punish them. And so all along, you begin to get this picture that all along, He's included people. He's been, he's been reaching out to people, right? It's not just a New Testament idea. We're familiar with Peter. Uh, when in 2 Peter he says, God wants all people to come to salvation, right? And so we're very comfortable with this idea, praise the Lord all nations, because we want all nations to praise Him, to be in relationship with Him. But coming out of a Jewish mouth... Kind of gives you, kind of gives you a pause, doesn't it? You kind of got to stop and think about where he's coming from and, and why he would say this. But then you start looking at the Old Testament and you see God has always wanted more and more people to come to Him. Abraham's family was special, but really anyone who came into that covenant with Him was special too. And so, at the very outset. This psalm begins to challenge us if we read it slowly and thoughtfully, right? Praise the Lord, all nations. Okay, that's, that's a little odd. Extol Him, all peoples. Again, all peoples? But, but God, we're your special family. Yeah, but whoever obeys is actually the special family. Again, we're comfortable with that idea in the New Testament. You don't see it as clearly in the Old Testament although it is there, pervasive in the Old Testament. And you see it here very clearly in Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all nations, extol Him, all peoples. And the next verse is going to blow you out of the water, though. If you were kind of a little bit stumped on, on verse 1, verse 2 it should really give you cause for pausing. Listen to what he says. For great is His steadfast love. That's an important word, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Great is His steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. And that's it. 
That's all this psalm says. Then we move on to Psalm 118. This is a very tiny but incredibly powerful psalm. So let's sit with it a little bit. Let's talk about verse 2. For great is his steadfast love. This word, steadfast love, uh, is really tough to translate. Uh, It's been, I'm told, it's been translated 169 different ways in six different English translations. That is next to an untranslatable word. Um, this concept, people have struggled with how to, how to uh, translate it. In fact, um, Miles Coverdale in 1535 said that he translated this word as loving kindness, steadfast love. And so that's, that's, it's, it's been a pervasive idea, this loving kindness. You see that in the King James. You see it in some, some of the even newer translations. Um, but 169 different ways, in six different translations, this word has been translated. And so we kind of struggle to understand what this word steadfast love means. Let me, let me give you the Hebrew word first. It's hesed. And so if you want to do a word study on this word, this is the word that, that you'd be studying, hesed. And maybe the best we can do with it during our time today is just simply to say that it's love plus commitment. It's love plus commitment. Uh, Again, it's been translated faithful love, loving kindness, merciful kindness. Uh, One scholar calls it a loyal love. Uh, He sees it as God sticking with us through the thick and the thin. He is committed, right? Committed to us. The amazing thing about this word is, who is it directed at? Remember, out of the mouth of a Jewish man who would have his normal Jewish inclinations about Gentiles, says his great steadfast love, his committed love through thick and thin is directed is toward us. Toward who? Toward the Gentiles or toward the Jewish people? It's not toward the, just the Jewish people. Remember, praise the Lord all nations, extol him all peoples. And so his great steadfast love is directed at everyone. In the Old Testament, that ought to make us stop and think. Uh, We need to stop and pause on this concept. His committed love is directed toward everyone. It's really phenomenal. Uh, This little word is so power-packed, has said. Love and commitment. Let me give you a mental picture, maybe. There's an entire book of the Bible that really illustrates this pretty well. Uh, It's the book of Hosea. Hosea was a prophet in the Old Testament who lived right before um, the northern nation goes into exile. And he is going to lead uh, a very interesting and a very hard life. Um, We have to talk about his uh, life in uh, in gentle terms, I suppose, because they're little ears. Uh, But his wife... uh, led a life of harlotry, I guess, is the best way we can say it. Uh, And he uh, had children with her. This is a commandment by God. This isn't just his idea. God says, I'm going to use your family as an illustration for my hesed, for my committed love toward my people. Well, stop and wrap your mind around that for a second. This is what Hosea does. He goes out and he finds this woman uh, on, on the street. And he marries her, brings her out of that lifestyle, has three children with her, and then she goes back into that lifestyle. What does Hosea do? Well, because God is using this relationship, these, these, this marriage, as an illustration for his hased, his committed love to his people, he says to Hosea to go get his wife back out of that lifestyle again. He's once again going to have to pay the price, like literal money, to buy her out of that lifestyle. And he's going to take her back home, and they, I guess they live happily ever after. But Hasid, this committed love, with us through the thick and the thin, no matter what. That's the picture that God is painting in Psalm 117. 
not just for the Jewish people, but for all nations. He's committed to bringing them to Him. Committed to them praising Him. Now, it just kind of gets more interesting from here. <laughs> uh, grab your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 through 7. This is one of the places where God will take on this term, this hased term, this committed love, as a personal characteristic of His. It's one of the things that makes Him God. This hased, this committed love, loyal love, steadfast love. Also translated as loving kindness. Exodus chapter 34, he says, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. Listen to how he's uh, describing himself. He's not done. Slow to anger and abounding in chesed, steadfast love, committed love, and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love, there's our word again, for thousands Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. He can be characterized as chesed, committed love, faithful love. And so when we come in contact with this word here in Psalm 117, we need to wrap our minds around what he's talking about. In Psalm 117, he's saying, for great is his steadfast love, his committed love toward everyone. Remember, he's an inclusive God. It's not something you might see very readily in the Old Testament. We see it pretty easily because we're on this side of the cross and we have the New Testament. We know that there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither free nor slave. None of that stuff matters anymore. (coughs) Now the only thing that matters is whether you are inside of Christ or whether you're outside of Christ. That's really the only distinction that matters anymore. Um, And so we might struggle a little bit here in the Old Testament to be able to get back to their mindset. They were very exclusive. Uh, This is like a country club. you got to be a card kid. It's like Sam's. You ever gone into Sam's without your card? Sometimes they won't even let you in. I mean, it's, it's, it's exclusive. That's kind of how the Jewish people viewed their relationship with God. He wasn't for everyone. He was just theirs. He would bless just them. And throughout the Old Testament, God throws up passages like this, kind of time and time and time again, where He says, I'm inclusive. He wants everyone to come to come to him. Uh, Job is a good example of that. Early on, Job is not a Jew. He is very early on uh, in, uh, in, in Scripture, in the history of the world. But what does God do for him? He loves him and is in relationship with him. Job is one of the more blessed people on the planet that really has ever lived, if you think about it, because he got to have a conversation with God, a lengthy conversation. Now, it wasn't a great conversation. He might not have enjoyed it, but he got to have it. That's something I've not got to do yet. So we should look up to Job, is my point. Time and time again in the Old Testament, you see God being inclusive, not exclusive. So maybe we shouldn't be surprised when we come to Psalm 117. Now, maybe if you mark in your Bibles, you need to make those notations for what we talked about, especially maybe underline steadfast love, because it's going to be a recurrent theme in Scripture. He's going to use this word a lot uh, to describe himself, to describe his relationship with his people. So maybe mark, you know, underline that word. Um, But if you do write in your Bibles, write Romans chapter 15, verses 8 through 11 in in the margin of your Bible, right there next to Psalm 117, verse 2. Paul is going to use Psalm 117 exactly the way that we're using it this morning. And that's kind of fantastic. Uh, when Paul preaches your sermon for you, <laughs> you're on pretty good, I guess. Uh, but listen to what he says. The Roman church is, 
in our day, we might compare them to New York or L.A. Uh, they are an incredibly diverse congregation. In this church, <clears throat> Paul would not have been here. <clears throat> Excuse me. I haven't taken my allergy medicine in the last couple of days, and I'm paying for it now. Um, so Paul has never met the Roman church, the Roman Christians. Um, he did not found this congregation. He knows about them now, and he's writing them a letter in the hopes that he'll get to them someday soon and that they'll finance his trip on into Spain so that he can remind and tell all nations to praise the Lord. But here in Romans chapter 15, he, he's kind of giving them a treatise here. Um, I wonder if Paul is a little concerned that they think, that maybe they would think that this Everyone is wanted. Everyone is desired. Everyone is the same. I think he might be concerned that they think that this is his harebrained idea. That this is something that Paul, the great, the great scholar, the incredible rabbi, the great missionary, the great thinker of his day, and Paul was, maybe one of the greatest thinkers of his day. Maybe he has pulled this thought out of thin air and he's just espousing this idea that, that God doesn't, a spouse. And so Paul puts together this argument. No, no. This is not my idea. This is God's idea. And he's going to show you how it's God's idea from the very beginning, just like we've done. Uh, he's going to point to not one passage in the Old Testament, but three, including our passage here in Psalm 117. Listen to what he says. Romans chapter 15. He says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant. That's what, that's what servants do, right? They show kindness toward other people. So Christ did that. He became a servant to the circumcised, to the Jewish people, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. Okay. Everything seems normal so far. Got it. Jesus was a servant showing how these promises that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were really fulfilled in Christ. I got it. Verse 9. And in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Paul might have just thrown us for a little bit of a loop there if we're a first century Jew. Because most first century Jews were very much like Jonah. Whoa, whoa. I was, I was good with you in verse, verse 8. Where you were talking about you know, the patriarchs and, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and the things that, that the... Jesus did is fulfilling them. But what did you say about the Gentiles again? Did, did you just say that all that happened so that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy? Paul would say, yes. It's always been the point that everyone would come to Him. Always been the point. Um, as it is written, listen, this is where Paul says, this isn't my idea. This isn't something I've come up with. This is something God's been talking about from the very beginning. I'm just telling you what He said. So as it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. There's an Old Testament passage where he says, you know, God's always wanted the Gentiles to come to him. The Roman church would have been incredibly diverse, right? There would have been Jews and there would have been Gentiles in one church. We're pretty far away from that mindset where those kinds of things matter today. But that is a boiling pot. That is an accident waiting to happen. That is hateful words, hateful actions, just, just ready to happen. When you put Jew and Gentile in one room, there's going to be a fight. The amazing thing that God has done, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, is He's made them one body. He's made them one. He's cut out all the distinctions, all the prejudices, all the things that have stood in their way in the past. And he's made them one. And even more than that, he's reconciled that one body back to himself. So he's done something incredible here in the Roman church and in our church and in churches around the world. He's made, he's made them one. So there's no longer Jew or Greek in the Roman church. Those things don't matter. There's, there's no longer slave or free. Those things don't matter. The socioeconomic strata, the classes, the class wars, uh, you were rich and I was poor, those, those things don't, don't matter anymore. Um, black or white, 
doesn't matter anymore. Paul says there's one thing that matters. Are you inside of Christ? Or are you outside of Christ? That's the one distinction that matters now. All this other stuff, he's, he's abolished it. He's done away with it. Those things don't, they don't matter anymore. They're, we're one body now. We're all the same. He says, I don't want you to think this is my idea. This is not my idea. This is God's idea. And he points to an Old Testament reference here in verses 9 and 10. And then again in, in verse 10, he says, Again, it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Another Old Testament verse where Paul brings in the Calvary, so to speak. And he says, well, This isn't my idea. God's been talking about this, this from, from the very beginning. This is something he's always wanted. In verse 11, he points to his third and final reference to the Old Testament where God is wanting to include everyone in his kingdom. And it's our, our passage, you'll recognize it from Psalm 117. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And so you begin to see God's inclusive nature. He wants everyone to come to him. And this is something that he has planned all along, since the beginning. Um, and that's, that's the thing that we find here in Psalm 117. Grab your Bibles. Turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. You're probably familiar with this passage. Um, Peter is a good Jew. He looks at the world very much like Jonah did. God is exclusive. He is our possession. He is ours. And so one day, he is sitting on top of a roof, and he's praying. It's about lunchtime, so he sends down uh, to get some lunch. And while they're fixing it, he falls into a trance. Uh, and God shows up in this vision, and he's got this sheet that's full of animals, every kind of animal, clean and unclean. And God's voice says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter I mean, you got to love Peter. Peter says, no, Lord, but... Okay, Peter. <laughs> no, Lord, but I'm a good Jew. I've never eaten anything that is unclean. I'm not going to start now. It's kind of what he says. And, and God actually has to give him this vision two more times. Finally, after the third time, the sheep goes away. The vision's over. Peter turns around. There's a guy behind him. And he says, it's the servant. He says, hey, there's some guys downstairs that say that they're looking for you. Uh, and they want you to come with them right away. And so Peter goes with them. And he goes, gets to this guy's house. His name's Cornelius. Uh, he is not a Jew. He is a Roman centurion. This guy's a soldier. In fact, he's a leader of soldiers. He's got 100 men underneath his command. He comes, uh, he has called for Peter, and Peter has come to this guy's house. Um, when he gets there, he kind of says something like this. Um, I'm a, my name's Peter, and I'm a good Jew, and um, God told me to come to you, so I came, but it's not really good for me to be here because just associating with you, coming into your house, talking with you, uh, kind of makes me unclean. So God told me to come, so I came. So what do you need? I'm paraphrasing. You should go back and read for yourself. But that's essentially what Peter says. And Cornelius then speaks up and says, Well, about three days ago, I was about, right about this time of day, I was praying and I was fasting. And uh, God told me where to find you and to tell you to come to me. And so I immediately sent my servants, and they went and got you, and here you are. Tell us what the Lord says. It's kind of an evangelist's dream, right, Jeremy? You've got a whole group of people, a whole family there waiting. Uh, you come to their house, and they say, just tell us what the Lord wants from us. So Peter does what any good evangelist would do. Okay, here's what the Lord says. And he teaches the truth to them. They come to faith and they are immersed into Jesus' kingdom. And so the distinctions that had once divided Peter and Cornelius were now gone. You see the distinctions before, right? 
before their baptism, you see that stuff because Peter wasn't exactly where God wanted him to be mentally just yet. Wasn't quite there yet. Here's a Roman who's in charge, who has enslaved God's people. That's one arm's length. He's a Gentile. That's at least another arm's length. He's a soldier. That's at least another arm's length. Peter's pretty far away from this guy in the beginning. Then he starts thinking, I'm guessing, about that vision, about God has made everything clean. When Cornelius says, tell us what the Lord wants from us, Peter says, well, he wants the exact same, from, the exact same thing from you that he wants from me. And he's willing to give you hased if you give that to him. If you are loyal to him, he'll be loyal to you. And so they're baptized, Cornelius and his entire household. And now all the things that separated Peter and Cornelius are gone. Because those things don't matter anymore. Slave or free, black or white, Jew or Gentile, rich or poor. Those are just words. And they don't really hold any sway anymore. Now the only thing that holds sway, the only thing that really matters is, are you inside of Christ? Are you outside of Christ? That's the only distinction that matters anymore, starting on the day of Pentecost. All right, there's the background. Let me dive into the text. Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Listen to what Peter says uh, right after Cornelius tells him what he, you know, tell us what God wants from us. Peter said, he opened his mouth, and he said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. You've probably heard that verse before, right? Maybe you've never read the Greek behind that word, partiality. It's literally, he's no acceptor of face. Now, Greek's kind of an idiomatic language, uh, so you kind of got to read between the lines here. But what he's saying is, he's not going to make his judgments based on what your face looks like. Jew or Gentile, black or white. Slave or free. It's not what he makes his judgments based on. He will tell uh, Samuel, remember, I don't look at the appearance of man. I look at what's going on in his heart. Now the only distinction that matters is, are you inside of Christ or are you outside of Christ? He shows no partiality otherwise. We are in the midst of a fairly significant time in our culture where we are drawing lines. Our culture is drawing lines where God didn't draw them. People are saying skin color matters. It doesn't. Socioeconomic class matters. That's not what God says. I want to draw the line where He draws it. So to help us think through some of these issues that seem very, very big, I wanted to give us some, some maybe practical pointers. Uh, I think that what we can do, the solution that we can offer is just listen. As our African-American friends and family are, are hurting, the thing that we can do is, is listen. So I wanted to give you a couple of tidbits maybe that will help us listen well we think of much of this situation as maybe a, an either or situation uh, well if they wanted their cause to be listened to they would stop rioting and stop protesting and they'd stand up when the anthem was 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 saying right i don't think that this is an either or situation i think this is a both and situation two opposing views can be true in our current situation. Their cause can be just. People shouldn't die from being pulled over. While at the same time, rioting, looting, rioting and looting are wrong. Both those things can be true. America can be both a great place to live and still struggle with racism. Both those things can be and I think are true. And we need to not discount what they're saying because of the other things that are going on. It's not an either-or situation. It's a both-and 
situation. The second thing I want us to remember as we listen is racism's a sin. It's not the worst sin because there's not a worst sin, right? All sin is evil. All sin has separated us from God. And so racism is a sin, but it's not the worst sin. So I guess what I'm trying to get us to, to think through is don't allow the pendulum to swing back too far either way. Uh, it is not the worst sin, but also don't ignore this thing. Sin is sin. And we're beginning to see the effects of sin, of this particular sin, leaping up in our country. This cannot be allowed to continue. We need to realize that all sin separates us from God. Third thing, don't get distracted. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on uh, with the kneeling of, during the anthem and the rioting and the looting and stuff, among other things, that kind of gets your blood boiling and you stop listening, or even worse, throw that back in their faces as an attempt to discredit their pain and the injustice that they've received. Um, those things are just distractions. Satan's kind of good at getting us to see a distraction instead of dealing with the sin. It's kind of what he's done since the beginning, right? Here's the sin. He doesn't want you to deal with the sin, so he, deal, he throws up a distraction. These things are just distractions. Don't, don't get marred down in this stuff. See it, hear it, understand it, and then actually deal with the sin part of it. Don't, don't get distracted. Don't get bogged down in the other stuff. Luke chapter 6, verse 35. He says, But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the most high for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil in addition to not making a distinction God doesn't make we need to be kind God is characterized by his kindness it's one of the things that he's known for and it ought to be one of the things that his people are known for too we think it's really odd when a little boy grows up and he doesn't have the morality uh, or, or the same kind of attitude. Um, he doesn't love the same things as his dad does. He doesn't act like his dad. We think that's kind of odd, right? If, it, if the little boy's just gone as far away from the father as possible. That's kind of odd in our culture. Because dad ought to look like, or a son ought to, ought to act, look like his dad, right? He says, your father is characterized by kindness. And so when we don't show kindness, we don't look like or function very much like our Father. So what can I do? What can I do here? Right now, I think the most useful thing we can do to serve our African-American friends and family is simply to listen. Um, we just need to listen. Let me read, let me read Romans 12. Just as a, Paul provides us some very practical, very useful, helpful tips here that I think we just need to soak down into um, our hearts. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 says, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. <coughs> Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Listen to this. Weep with those who weep. Right now there's a half of our country, a good bit of our country it is weeping. God's people ought to weep too. Ought to weep with them. Verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. 
Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it's written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, you feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. He didn't say overcome evil with Facebook memes. Evil, overcome evil with harsh speech. Overcome evil by fill in the blank. Overcome evil with good. Let me give you some final thoughts and we'll leave it there. This is not not a political issue. Racism is not a political issue. We've made a lot of progress on this front, right? Since the 1850s and 60s when the Civil War was going on, slavery was abolished. Very good thing, right? 1960s when civil rights was going on and, and legally you have to treat people in a certain way no matter their skin tone. That's progress, right? But look what we're still dealing with, what, 70 years later? You know why? Because the government can't mandate sin. It can't mandate hearts. Racism is a church issue. It's a God issue. It's something only He has the solution for. And thankfully, He's given us the solution. And so as the holders, as the guardians of his truth. We need to be sharing that with people. The church is the answer to this particular problem. God has the answer. This is a, a church issue. That's why we're spending time talking about it today because I don't think it's a political one. You can't mandate hearts. You can't change hearts with a law. We tried that, right? 1860, 1960. It's not working. You can mandate how someone acts, but you can't change their heart. Changing the heart is God's arena. This is His thing. He's got the answer. He's given the answer to us. This is the church's problem. We need to stop discrediting their pain. Um, I don't make the laws. I can't even make the laws for the church. Uh, all I can do is tell you what the Bible says about the matter. My comments are not directed uh, at any political reforms or even the activity that our congregation should be participating in. Just talking to each individual Christian. I think we need to stop trying to discredit their pain and their injustice for a couple reasons. I think we do that. I think maybe we think we've struggled too. So why is their pain any different than mine? Second thing is because maybe they did something wrong. None of that matters really, right? We just need to stop and listen as they talk through this. Uh, we need to stop and listen like <clears throat> as they talk through this just like you would stop and listen to someone who's just lost a loved one. If you look at what they're saying, this is anger, pain, and grief, and betrayal. It's, it's classic symptoms of grief. Just like you feel when someone you love died. Now, what's the answer to getting you over that, through that pain? Well, it's not ignoring it. And certainly you would never walk up to someone and belittle their pain, right? Well, I lost my mom too, so get over yourself. You know, you would never say that. I think one of the things that we can do that would be very cathartic for um, our African-American friends and family, for our nation, for ourselves, is just help them work through their grief. Stop and listen to the story. Stop and listen just to them. Not, not think about your answers, now think about what you want to say to respond, not to promote an agenda, but just to stop and listen. We need to empathize with them. Listen, hurt for them. Look for opportunities to bring healing to their grief. This is a Romans 12 thing. This is, a, a, this is something that the church can do. This is something that the Bible speaks to in incredibly specific ways. In fact, it's one of the things that drove Jesus to the cross to, to bring the separation that happens between people away, to demolish that thing. He has worked incredibly hard to make everyone one, to make everyone one body. 
Let's not get in His way as the church. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul makes this argument that one of the most fantastic, amazing, groundbreaking things that God has done at the cross was to bring Jew and Gentile together in one. We have an opportunity in, in our tumultuous times to speak healing, and to speak hope back into a community that is struggling. That's not a government thing. That's a Jesus thing. That's one of the things that He's good at. That's one of the things that only He can do. And as His people, it's our responsibility to act and react as He would. To do the things that He would do. To speak His truth, to speak His healing in this situation. This morning, if you've not been baptized, remember that's the only line of demarcation that matters anymore. There is no other distinction that matters. God is not an acceptor of face. The only thing that matters to Him now is, are you inside of Christ? Or are you outside of Christ? That's the only thing that matters. So this morning, if you're outside of Christ, you need to get inside of Him, having your sins washed away by the power of His blood in baptism. Maybe you've already made that step this morning and you just need the prayers of the church to be who God would have you to be, uh, to, to, to speak His truth, not just in this isolated scenario, but to speak His truth in, in every, in any scenario that's going on in our broken and hurting world. If you have any need this morning, why don't you come as we stand and sing. Uh, See your smiling faces or half your faces smiling behind a mask. Um, if you need to leave your contribution, don't forget the buckets in the back and do that as you, as you leave here. Let's close this morning with number 802. <clears throat>
Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come to you now thanking you for this beautiful day that you have given us, this time that we've had this morning to, to sing praises to you and to hear our lesson from your word. Father, we thank you. Thank you for Chris and the lesson that he has brought us, that we will apply it to our daily lives and, and strive to, to know your love for us. Father, we do pray for so many that are on the sick list, uh, the, dealing with cancer, dealing with health concerns, or in the hospital, or recovering, that you'll continue to be with them and you'll strengthen and put your loving arms around them. Father, we pray that you'll be with all the ones that are traveling this weekend and this week coming, that you'll keep them safe to and from their destination. Father, we also do pray for the ones that have lost loved ones this past week, that you will continue to be with them and show them strength and com comfort. We thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for Jesus, that he was willing to die for us. We thank you for everything you do. In Jesus' name, amen.